Good morning, Team Alabama. We are ready to begin reading 42. This is a story about Jackie Robinson. And it's baseball, basketball, football, tennis, track and field, no matter the game or competition, Jackie Robinson hit it out of the park. His exceptional talent should have easily landed him a career in pro sports. But in the United States in the 1930s and 40s, opportunities like those were closed to athletes like Jackie. His skin was the wrong color. Jackie settled for, being, for playing baseball in the Negro Leagues, but chafed at being unable to prove himself in the majors. Then in 1946, Branch Rickey, manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, decided that he was going to break segregation in the major leagues and recruited he recruited Jackie. Jackie accepted the offer knowing that it would be rough going. Again and again, he exhibited courage, restraint, and phenomenal talent. Despite being the target of cruel and sometimes violent hatred. In this compelling biography, an award-winning author, Doreen Rappaport, chronicles the extraordinary courage and dignity of Jackie Robinson, who not only broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball, but also changed white Americans' perceptions of black Americans. His impact reached beyond the world of sports, and he won over the hearts of all Americans and became an American hero. Please read on your Chromebooks this story about Jackie Robinson and it is called 42 is not just a number. 42 is not just a number. Please start a new Google Doc. You will do your 50 facts about Jackie Robinson on that Google Doc along with your 10 questions and your 10 vocabulary words. Page one, the neighborhood, 1927. Eight-year-old Jack swept the last bit of dirt from the front steps into a dustpan. Mama was so proud of their five-bedroom house and wanted everything in it to and around it to be neat and clean. The way his mother made good things happen, Jack liked to think of her as having magical powers. Seven, year, seven years earlier, when Jack's father abandoned the family, Mally Robinson had packed up her five children and moved from Georgia to California with only three dollars sewn into the lining of her petticoat. And a petticoat is like an, a, a dress underneath the dress. Um, it's like a slip, if you know what a slip is. It's, it's usually white and it's long and it kind of makes your um, dress not stick to you. Other members of Mally's family came along, too. Her sister, Cora Wade, Cora's husband, Sam, and their two sons. Within only a few days of arriving in Pasadena, Mally landed a job for five days a week, 52, 52 weeks a year. She cleaned and cooked for a white family. She worked hard for $8 a week, but she never complained. She was gone from early morning until night. So much of Jack's care fell to his older sister, Willa May. And for the first two years in California, the Robinsons and the Wades lived together in an apartment sharing rent. Sam's job didn't pay much more than Mama's. Yet miraculously, within two years, the families had squirreled away enough pennies and nickels and dimes for a down payment on a house. When Mama saw 121 Pepper Street for sale, she thought it was one of the finest on the block. The house, however, was in a white working class neighborhood. The neighbors got an unpleasant surprise when the two black families moved into the two-story clabbered house. Someone burned a cross on the lawn. Another person went from house to house in the neighborhood to find someone who could buy them out, but no one had enough money, so the family stayed. It took time, but Mama eventually won the respect of most of her white neighbors. She had sent Jack's older brother, Edgar, to do odd jobs at no charge for Mrs. Coppersmith, a widow who lived next door. A nearby bakery gave Mama its day-old leftovers. The milkman gave her unsold milk. Mally could have easily used the baked goods and milk to help feed her large family, but she shared whatever she received with her neighbors, even the ones who were hostile. Okay, we're going to stop there and we want to talk about facts. So what do we know? Okay, I want you to write down a few facts right now. We know that at seven years old, Jack's father abandoned them. Jack's mom was Mally Robinson. 
and she had five children. So he had four brothers and sisters. They moved from Georgia to California and mom only had $3 sewn into her petticoat when they left, okay? Her sister was Cora Wade and Cora's um, husband was Sam and they had two sons and they moved in together and helped share the expense, okay? They lived in an apartment together for several years and she made $8 a week, okay? There are several more facts that you can add. Please go ahead and do so at this time. The reason we get good at writing facts are so that when you get to those classes in high school and it's biology or it's American history and you're reading a chapter, you need to write down those facts as notes, okay? And those notes are things then that you would go back and study once you reach high school. Okay, page three. Some neighbors still resented having a black family on the block. One frequently called the police to complain that Edgar, whizzing around on roller skates, made too much noise. An elderly couple scurried inside their house whenever any of the children walked their way. Two years later, in 1924, Uncle Sam and Aunt Cora had saved enough money to buy a separate house just a few blocks away. Now, 121 Pepper Street belonged just to Mama, but she needed more money to meet expenses. Jack wished that he could help, but he was still too young to get paying jobs like his older brothers. Next year, he might be able to get a newspaper route or mow lawns. For now, Mama believed that he could sweep so that he was going to do, do it and do it good. Mama's flowers were her pride and joy, so she really liked flowers. So was, back, so was the backyard with its vegetable garden and fruit trees. Sometimes Mama raised turkeys and chickens and ducks and rabbits, but her green thumb, livestock, and salary weren't always enough to feed her family of six. Many nights, Jack's dinner was bread soaked in milk or in water and sugar or leftovers that Mama brought home from her job. Some mornings, Jack was so hungry he could hardly stand up when he got to school. Jack finished sweeping the front walk and moved on to the sidewalk. Across the street, a girl was coming out of her house, and she glared at Jack and then shouted, and she used the N-word, and we're not going to do that. We're not going to say that word, um, but she used the N-word several times. As young and little as she was, Jack could not let this racial slur pass. His grandma Edna, born a slave, took great pride in being black and had taught Jack that Negro was the only proper name for their race. Any other name was a slur and should not be tolerated. In a flash, Jack was shouting and returning the insult with a cry of blank. And we're not going to say that one either. A derogatory term for poor rural whites in the South. The girl's father overheard Jack's taunt and charged outside to throw stones at Jack. Jack threw stones right back at him. Stones flew until the girl's mother came outside and yelled at her husband for fighting with a child. Chapter 2, Jack's Idol Jack idolized his older brother Mac, not just for his athletic ability, but for his character and determination as well. So there's a great fact. Jack idolized his older brother Mac. In junior high, Mac was already a star athlete in football, baseball, basketball, and track and field when he was diagnosed with a heart murmur. There's another good fact for you. The school, fearing that something could happen to Mac if he played, banned him from all competitive sports. Mac refused to accept their decision and turned to his mother for help. Mally met with school officials and convinced them to at least let Mac participate in non-contact sports. Mac returned to track and field and became a superstar sprinter. He won many events and set a statewide record for high hurdles. There's a great fact for you. Mac set a statewide record for high hurdles. Mac was in high school now and hadn't lost a race so far this year. Today he was competing for John Muir Technical High School in the 100 yard dash. Jack tried never to miss watching a meet. Jack was a natural athlete himself, always playing something. His keen hand-eye coordination made him a marbles champion. Okay, keen would be a great word to add to your vocab. 
In games of dodgeball, Jack moved so fast that no one could ever hit him. With Jack on the field, his third grade soccer team was so good that they were able to challenge the sixth grade team and win. In the schoolyard at lunchtime, he played handball. No matter what game or sport, Jack always played to win and usually did. For all the pride he took in his talents, however, he knew that he could never run as fast as Mac. Mac crouched in starting position, hips up, weight resting on his fingertips. A sprinter had to be ready to run as soon as the pistol signaled the start of the race. So his stance was critical. So was his reaction time. There wasn't a split second to lose. The pistol shot popped. Jack watched Mac take off, spraying dirt behind him. Mac pumped his legs hard, his eyes focused on the track. He never looked over his shoulder or to the side. That could add fractions of a second to his time and cost him the race. Jack knew that Mac was thinking of only one thing, winning. Mac picked up speed and Jack yelled and cheered along with every other Muir fan as his brother crossed the finish line ahead of the pack. Okay, we're going to stop there today. You should have at least five to ten facts already. If you don't, please go back and reread and add a couple more. Have a great rest of your day, Team Alabama.